Hello everyone, welcome back to SFF 180. Thomas here, your host as always. That's right, I'm doing a Top 5 Wednesday video. Don't expect this to be a regular thing, but with this week's topic I thought it would be a fun way to lead into Halloween. Now, when writing fantastic fiction, whether it's fantasy, science fiction, horror, steampunk, whatever, world building is an essential element of the storytelling process. It's not enough to set your story in some imaginary realm. You have to make the experience feel immersive and real, a place readers will actually believe. World building isn't just about creating a vivid setting either. It's about establishing a mood and an atmosphere. And while genres like epic fantasy and space opera usually seek to evoke a sense of wonder, sometimes there is another goal. In a scary story, the goal is to evoke tension and fear. Movies and video games have excelled at this, of course. The unlit corridors of the USS Nostromo or the foggy, decayed streets of Silent Hill are intrinsic to the experiences of those stories. And it's safe to say the endlessly looping apartment in the PT video game demo has given more people nightmares than anything in recent memory. But literary fantasy and science fiction has been no slouch when it comes to terrifying settings. Here are five of the creepiest, weirdest, and most downright chilling settings in SFF and dark fantasy that just might have you sleeping with the lights on. The Cthulhu mythos stories of H.P. Lovecraft are so rich in creepy settings that it would take very little effort to make a top five creepiest Lovecraftian settings video. Now, the best known of these is probably the fictional town of Arkham, Massachusetts, home of the legendary Miskatonic University, whose library houses among its rare books collection a copy of the evil Necronomicon. But Arkham itself, yeah, aside from some Fairly eccentric residence isn't all that creepy, mostly being inspired by Lovecraft's hometown of Providence, Rhode Island. One unforgettable setting has to be the accursed seaside village of Innsmouth, whose locals, under the rule of the Marsh family and their church, the Esoteric Order of Dagon, offer human sacrifice to the race of Deep Ones living in an abyssal trench off the coast. The town itself full of decaying mansions and crumbling old factories is shunned by the outside world. And I can just imagine what the Yelp reviews would look like for the Gilman House Hotel, where the narrator of A Shadow Over Innsmouth is forced to spend the night. Nice place, spacious rooms. Uh, I had to jump out of my window at one point when the crazy local cultists tried to barge in and murder me, but uh, hey, the linens were fresh. Yes, it's true that Lovecraft's notorious racism informs the plot. It is, after all, a not-too-thinly-veiled tale about the perceived horrors of race mixing. The local inhabitants possess the Innsmouth look, which, which is like creepy, fish-like physical deformities due to years of uh, <coughs> Congress with the Deep Ones. But as dark, dangerous, frightening, isolated, nightmare-shrouded towns go, Innsmouth is one of horror fiction's most deservedly famous. Perdido Street Station put China Mieville on the map in a big way, and one only has to read the book to see why. A massive and sprawling weird fantasy epic incorporating elements of steampunk, clockpunk, and buggy horror there's never been anything quite like it in fantasy fiction, and its success is due in no small part to its setting, the ancient city-state of New Crobazon, a vast, smoky metropolis rendered with a level of attention to detail so meticulous it makes Blade Runner 2049 look like a dinner theater production of Our Town. If any of you actually get that reference, I will be damn impressed. A hive of incomprehensible warrens, dank streets, Rivers, sewers, and slums, New Crobazon is home to both human and non-human species, including the bird-like Garuda and the insect-headed Kepri. One neighborhood, Bonetown, is noted for being 
built within the titanic ribcage of some long-dead beast that no one knows even what the hell it was. In the novel, the city is terrorized by an infestation of slake moths, giant insects who hypnotize their victims with their wings before drinking the poor bastard's minds. The city's most ruthless crime lord is keeping the moths because their milk can be sold as a powerful narcotic. And I haven't even told you the creepy parts yet. New Crobazon is notable for being one of those settings so vivid the city itself becomes a character. It's a grim, violent, anxiety-inducing place to be, but you can't tear yourself away. It's bizarre and dreamlike and just plain huge. It's so prodigious, it's mind-blowing. And while fans might debate among themselves if Mieville quite ever recaptured lightning in a bottle the way he did in Perdido Street Station, none of them would tell you that a little urban exploration through the districts of New Crobazon isn't worth the trip. Jeff Vandermeer's Nebula award-winning novel Annihilation is about to hit the mainstream in a big way early next year with the release of a film adaptation by the director of Ex Machina. But before that happens, you can pick up the book and experience Area X for yourself. Located near an unspecified coastal region of the U.S., Area X is an abandoned and cordoned off region that nature has begun to reclaim aggressively. But it's not just good old mother nature. The landscape has taken on bizarre and surreal characteristics that have led to all kinds of speculation, including, but not limited to, aliens. And the whole area is under investigation by an organization called the Southern Reach, which we soon learn has some dark secrets and hidden agendas of its own. Annihilation, the first book in the Southern Reach trilogy, is unforgettable for its haunting and eerie scenes detailing the exploration of Area X by an all-female team of scientists and researchers. They are, we are told, the twelfth such expedition into the region, and all the previous ones have been lost under mysterious and violent circumstances. The trilogy is not one that offers easy answers to all of its questions, but wandering through this acid trip of a landscape, you're likely to be so creeped out by what you find, you won't sweat the details. One of science fiction's more underappreciated space opera epics, Richard Paul Russo's Ship of Fools, which I discussed in this video, is a multi-layered novel exploring class struggle aboard a generation ship called the Argonos that's been traveling in deep space for so long, no one on board remembers its own origins. The book is also a full-blooded horror story, offering an examination of evil as an existential force in the universe, standing apart from philosophical or theological understanding. Though the book's narrative is a veritable banquet of characters, scenes, and ideas, the central plot details what happens after the ship discovers a planet, which they name Antioch, that appears not only suitable for human life, but home to a pre-existing human settlement. However, a landing team discovers the colonists came to a pretty bad end. But this is nothing compared to what they discover later. Following a signal directed into deep space, from one of the colony buildings, the Argonos discovers a gargantuan vessel of unknown origin, just floating out there in the void. And that's as much as I'm going to tell you. Yes, derelict spaceships are something of a cliché, but clichés can be refreshed in a new context. And what Russo does with this old trope is nothing short of bone-chilling. The vessel itself, which seems to have no crew and nothing inside it except winding corridors and no instrumentation and weirdly variable gravity is one of the most unsettling environments you'll ever encounter in a space opera. No, no face huggers, but don't worry, what's there might actually even frighten those little bastards off. Finally, we come to a work of fantasy fiction that, while it is less widely known, is considered by many readers and critics in the field to be as important to the development of modern fantasy as The Lord of the Rings. Mervyn Peake, like Tolkien, was an English writer, poet, and artist whose 
famously unfinished Gormenghast series was cut short by his death in 1968 from Lewy body dementia. That's the condition Robin Williams had. The chief distinction between LOTR and the Gormenghast novels is that the Gormenghast novels are low fantasy without the use of traditional tropes like magic or elves or dark lords or mythological elements. The narrative goal is more satire. The castle of Gormenghast, which has been held by the Grown family for generations, is insular and stagnant, where pointless rituals are endlessly repeated for their own sake. The books could also be argued to have an early influence on Grimdark, as the most memorable character is Steerpike, a lowly kitchen boy who plots and schemes and murders his way into greater positions of power. He's an amazing villain who would be right at home in Game of Thrones. But the castle itself is an extraordinary creation, although it might not be strictly accurate to say it's creepy, though it can be. Mostly it's melancholy and sad. It's so enormous, and described as being almost like a city in its own right, that entire sections of it have been abandoned and forgotten for centuries. Some of those abandoned areas are inhabited by forgotten people. Like New Crobuzon, the castle is a setting that's a character. Or, more precisely, it's a setting that reflects the shifting emotional and psychological landscape of the characters who live within it. It's a richly realized setting for a series of unique novels that have had a huge impact on everyone who's read them since their release. Bit of trivia, yes, you should read the books, but there was a BBC miniseries of Gormenghast released back in 2000. And you can search up and watch all four episodes of it right here on YouTube. And that's what I've got for this episode of SFF 180, everybody. So what are some of your favorite creepy settings in science fiction or fantasy or horror? Let me know in the comments. But otherwise, if you enjoyed watching, please slam that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you haven't done so already, that is how the channel grows, of course. You can also support the channel at its Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's Army get to see my videos the night before. I want to thank all of those people for being awesome supporters, just like I want to thank you folks for being great viewers. And until I see all of you next time, happy reading.